Hello and welcome to Unstress. My name is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. I don't know whether you think about this much. If you listen to this podcast, you probably do. But have you noticed how we are consistently encouraged to be good consumers? Not just by advertising, but by governments and banks. If consumer confidence is high, then apparently there's a, that's an indicator of a healthy economy. Well, what about being a good citizen? And rather than celebrating consumer confidence, we actually celebrate consumer consciousness. There are so many things to consider. The life cycle of a product, a circular or collaborative economy, supply chain issues, modern slavery, sustainable development goals, and much more. Well, my guest today is Kate Harris who is CEO of an organisation that we should all become a lot more familiar with, GECA, G-E-C-A, which stands for Good Environmental Choices Australia. Now, importantly, GECA is an organisation and an eco-label which is Australia's only, and this is really important, independent, not-for-profit, multi-sector sustainability and environmental certification program. Independent, not-for-profit. Really important. I hope you enjoy this conversation I had with Kate Harris. Welcome to the show, Kate. Thanks, Ron. Thanks for chatting with me. Now, Kate, uh, you're CEO of GECA. Uh, Can you share with our listener, I know you wear a few other different hats there, can you share with our listener a bit about your journey and how you got to this point? My journey is not not a linear one. It's it's always an interesting story, I guess. Um, you know, I, I started off singing and nursing, so um, you know, and then fell in love with the not for profit sector by combining those things as a clown doctor. So I'm definitely not uh, a linear trajectory to a CEO, but um, all of the things I have done along the way are things that I'm really passionate about, and it's always been about making a difference and being a service. Um, and you know, through that journey, whilst I was managing the Clown Doctor program, I had a, a son who was quite sick with and affected by things in the environment, and, and that really took me on a new professional journey and a personal one um, in in looking at environment, sustainability, social change and how all of those things are interconnected. So I did a Master's in Social Ecology and uh, really fell in love with you know, supporting leadership and systems change for making the world a, a better place for, for humanity and, and, and all, actually. Mm. Uh, and uh, GECA, just tell us a little bit about GECA. It's an acronym for... Yeah, so, well, it's interesting. I'm actually just changing it. It is it's known as Good Environmental Choice Australia, and so that's the acronym. Um, although we're going to start dropping the E and just make it about good choices mm. uh, because we also do um, social components as well as environment and health. And so some people don't see beyond um, when we're talking about GECA. Essentially, GECA is a not-for-profit organisation. It's 18 years old this year, and we're an eco-label. We're Australia's independent not-for-profit eco-label. And as well as that, we look at good choices and best practice for products and services so that consumers or procurers can actually choose things that are um, yeah, good for people on planet. So a lot of it is standards development as well as managing the eco-label and working with manufacturers. It's also understanding materiality of products, uh, what things cause harm uh, to people, to flora and fauna, and making sure that we're really driving and optimising and rewarding people who are doing the right thing, who are making uh, good products. And it's, it is about the care of people and not just profit. Yes, well, I, I heard you recently at that uh, at the Australian Society of Building Biologists conference, and there were just so many things you mentioned that I really wanted to ask you about and expand on, and that's why I'm really glad you've joined me today. Can we start with the economy? Because there were two terms you used that, that really fascinated me. One was called the circular economy, the other a collaborative economy. Can you explain those to our listener? 
Yeah, look, well, circular economy is something, I guess it's been around for a while, but we really haven't actualized it. And it really is coming from the philosophy that our resources are limited. It's one planet living. And so really we need to reuse, but also starting at the point of design. So designing with the end in mind and seeing the end as just the beginning and a closed loop system for reuse and renewal. Uh, and so that's really come to a head in Australia. Um, it, it's perhaps slightly more advanced in, in Europe and Australia. Just recently with the China thought and, and China now not taking our recycling, suddenly our waste and output is just piling up and we're suddenly going, oh, okay, <laughs> this, is why, this is what happens if we don't have a circular economy. We just have all this stuff. We have all this waste as well as the fact um, we need to acknowledge about, you know, the decline of resources. So how do we actually see waste as an opportunity? And I think circular economy is really exciting, actually, because it is creative thinking. It is about beauty and design and, you know, creative consciousness about the whole life cycle of a product. Um, and so that's the opportunity, I think, for, um, you know, and, and actually we're really good at that in Australia. There's a term in India called frugal innovation or jugaad, which I like. And it's, it's you know, if you, if, you, if you don't have something, you have to make do or be really creative, even in a frugal way, to, to be able to have something that you didn't before. And from a pioneering perspective, from rural Australia perspective, we also see frugal innovation. So it's actually something that we're naturally good at, but I think we've got a bit lazy on, we just go down to the shops and buy the next thing. Um, so now there's a real opportunity to think, you know, really strategically and creatively about the whole closed life cycle of a product or a service. And that's where also service you see is changing. A lot of people are encouraging like the service economy, like go get or, you know, just, just use a car when you want. You don't always need a car. Do we really have to buy everything? How can we be conscious consumers in another way? And so that takes us to collaborative economy, which is, well, how do we actually get to know our neighbours and start sharing? Like, do we all need a lawnmower uh, in the same street or could have good that actually sharing a lawnmower or a particular tool or something else or even a swimming pool, you know, actually create new neighbourhood connections and relationships. Um, you know, what if one had a trampoline and one had a pool and, and suddenly all the kids are hanging out in everyone's backyard? Like in some sense, it's not just about money and consumption when it comes to collaborative economy either. It's also about relationships, connection and community. So yeah, those two movements, um, are certainly growing and starting to be on board in Australia and even at a political level, which is exciting. Yes, because, I mean, it's interesting. We've referenced this study for many, many times and it keeps coming back in different forms. And that was the, the Harvard study on health and wellness and longevity found that the biggest predictor of all of those things was our relationships. <laughs> and, uh, you know, this <laughs> idea of connecting with the community. Wow, what a novel idea. When, who would have ever thought of that? <laughs> it's so true. You know, it, it's something... We seem to be losing in a way, and I know even some of the younger generations, like before Gecko, I was running uh, the Centre for Sustainability Leadership and, and working with a lot of young and emerging leaders. And a lot of them were quite distressed about this. It was their CSL, as, as it was known, is, was, became the only place that they felt they had really meaningful connections because everything was virtual or online or distant. Um, we also have vertical living and vertical communities that increase multi-residential and how do we, you know, there's facts about usually the closer you live together, the further apart your relationships are because there's a feeling or a fear of, you know, being too known or seen. So, you know, how do we actually bridge that and create community in different ways? And, you know, because I think actually Australia, we can, we can see that we are suffering in some ways from a lack of true yeah, a true connection and meaning in some of those broader relationships. Okay, well, you know, one of, one of the things that intrigues me is we are constantly, constantly being encouraged to be good consumers, not good citizens. And, I mean, after all, consumption is what seems to keep this modern economy going. But I love this term you used, a conscious consumption. How do we become conscious consumers? Look... 
think it it leads to being conscious in all things we do actually and it's um it's certainly not my term I'd like to on a bunky moon on that um and you know his work he really understood the problem and and if you look at it globally and from an economic perspective you're absolutely right we're being driven and pushed to consume um but I think it comes to being able to be conscious and aware in all things we do and being present. And then that step change to be able to, you know, look at that when we're buying and consuming. And, and, and I think that conscious consumption is the hardest battle of being present and conscious in, mm. while we're consuming because we're, we're absolutely being sabotaged and bombarded deliberately. Like I, I heard this... Um, presentation the other day you know from a a former Facebook uh, manager and it was all about buying your eyeball time and what they wanted you know and I thought wow I'm a yeah for the first time I really got how much of that I'm a commodity to them I'm all about a sale and how do I really feel about that um so I think there's a real reflection and understanding around the fact people actually want, you know, want to just sell you stuff. There's not often a care about who you are or your well-being, and I certainly see that in manufacturing. Um, you know, there's a lot of people, you know, there's those who do care about it and then there's those who don't and they, it's just about the, the profit. And so we need to do the work as consumers and advocates and governments to you know, call that out and work together and have really clear messaging so people can make conscious choices. And I think that's the challenge too. Is you know, unless you have that awareness of what's good or bad, you know, how do you know? Like I find that very much with, for instance, foam mattresses or you know, furnishings. You know, most people don't know the difference between a, you know, and it's not necessarily price actually, but you know, but as an example, if it's a really cheap couch or an expensive couch, do they really understand what those differences in or what's in their mattress they're sleeping in? Um, you know, some of the manufacturers don't want you to know what that's doing to your body, your health, and, you know, your mind, your spirit. So mm. we really do have to work together to sort of fight that together and have that information clear. And it doesn't mean that people then need to make those choices, but at least they have the awareness and understanding to choose consciously. And I think that's a human rights issue, actually, that we're really fighting against the marketing dollar right now. Yeah. <laughs> yes. It almost leads me to the next uh, a question. Not, it wasn't going to be my next one, but are you an optimist or, you know, do you describe yourself as an optimist, Kate? Because these market forces are very powerful, aren't they? They are very powerful and I've worked with a lot of advertising, uh, successful advertising agents actually who've gone to the other side and said they couldn't live with themselves anymore. Hmm. And I've, you know, there was one in particular who was driving past a billboard and he looked up and he knew that he'd designed it and he thought, my God, I'm actually, you know, I'm really, really, truly manipulating people in that and I can't do it anymore. And pretty much resigned the next day um, and mm. <laughs> now still works in sustainability. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, optimism, pessimism, yeah, look, I, I I fluctuate between the two. I used to be very much an optimist and I think most of the time I am, but I get frustrated. Um, I'm not pessimistic, I just get frustrated um, because for me I see it as common sense and I, I see human rights and what's happening and I go, gosh, why is it, why aren't more people aware of this or having this conversation or you know a lot of people say to me but surely our government wouldn't let that happen and it's like well Mm. you know there's minimum standards but sometimes that's not enforced either you know it's Mm. it's not just their responsibility like this stuff is happening even in Australia Um, but where I am optimistic is human potential I absolutely have faith in beauty and people and connectivity um, and our ability to make a difference together. And so I do think that that connection to ourselves, to our environment and to each other is remains and, and you know, will be rekindled. A lot of people in, you know, sustainability say it'll come at the end of the hour, you know, as, 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 as we all can't take anymore. And I think think that would be sad if we had to wait to that because I don't think we have to but if we do get to that point 
um, I do have faith that we will, yeah, we will come through and humanity will prevail. Yeah, I, 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 th- I share that view too. I, and I think if, uh, you know, pa- knowledge is power, um, then empowering people with knowledge about what, how and what they are consuming is a very big part of that because it seems like consumption is such a huge part of our lives. Absolutely. And so, you know, I guess it's the fight on greenwash is how to really clearly communicate and that's our challenge, you know. Um, mm. Most people in the general consumer market don't know Gecko and that is because we very much have been in the built environment because that's where it's been valued by procurers and consumers for green building screens. Mm. I mean, that's fantastic. But we, you know, we all have a role to broaden that to, you know, general consumer information and have very clear credible standards and mechanisms for people to go, oh, look, I don't need to know, I don't need to be a scientist, I don't need to know everything about that because this stuff is really complex. <laughs> but I do know that someone who, who is trusted, who's independent, mm. you know, who is transparent around it, has given it a, a label and so, okay, I'm going to go with that because in the complexity of the world on all of those, you know, consumption and decision, you know, we do need shortcuts and we do need trust and guided bodies to help us. And that's that's where our role is, and it's you know an ongoing challenge. But we want to work with consumers to to take that out um, and communicate that so it is clear. And I also want to reward the manufacturers that stand by that and our licensees that you know they don't have to. There's a lot of people who have cheaper products. There's a lot of people who you know don't care and they just want the best profit margin. But we have licensees who are committed to doing the right thing and. You know, we're wanting to reward them and and connect them with consumers, so at least they have the choice and the awareness to to be able to make that informed decision. Yes, and I think that's part of the problem is this kind of assumption that people make, and right again, rightly or wrongly, they make the assumption that if it's out on the market, if it's on the supermarket shelf, then it's been tested. It's gone through the tests. You know, they wouldn't put it out there if it didn't. And it comes as it's a very, it's a story that's very easy to miss. But once you hear it, it's very difficult to ignore that it's not the case. Yeah. No, no, that's not the case. Mm. And and the other challenge is, you know, supply chains are getting really complex. So, mm. you know, manufacturers really even struggle for them to know where all their stuff come from or what's in it to, you know, to the full detail. Um, and I guess what, the, what else is different is there's a difference between minimum standards, even in Australia, which, of course, are, you know, very robust but also uh, best practice standards and that upper echelon. And, and the, the upper echelon is about precautionary principle. And it's also, you know, it, it's knowing and looking and seeing what causes damage and making sure that, that, that they're not in those products. Whereas, you know, in terms of minimum compliance, it's more around, you know, what's acceptable or what, what the majority are able to achieve in a manufacturing frame. It doesn't mean that it's, you know, optimal for health and wellness for anyone. So, you know, it is It is really, I guess, that, again, thinking of the design principle of being precautionary and doing the right thing from the beginning, um, how, do we, how, do we, how do we drive everyone to do that? Mm. And in some ways, that's the role of the eco-label too. We keep upping our requirements. So as, as best practice gets easier and, you know, the sort of the lower hanging fruit start to improve, we, you know, and new technology comes to the fore, we will keep increasing that practice. Um, so that's part of our mechanism around driving, you know, driving change for, for people as well. Now, another thing you mentioned uh, was the challenges of supply chain and, and you're talking about life cycle of a product analysis and design is obviously one thing, but what are some of the other challenges that people face in their supply chain? You know, what are, they, what are the alarm bells and what should they be looking out for? Oh, look, it's, it's, I think the, the challenge is it depends on what kind of product and that's where our type of label or a true eco-label, the ISO 14024 is important because it's not generic. Um, so what I think people need to look out for actually is, is something specific to the product or service. There's a lot of things right now that there's, you know, like about like an organisational level or, you know, we do good or, um, you know, a good, a good healthy CSR report, you know. But actually, 
that that might not be what's core to your impact or or uh, what impact you're having actually by by buying that. So it can be material. I think the biggest thing is asking what is material to this product or service I'm buying. So if it's a foam mattress, you know, what mm. do I know about what's in it? Where has it come from? What is the biggest thing that's of relevance? in terms of where these things come from and all of the some of the materials that have gone into it. And that's very different to that, to a car or, you know, um, a piece of chocolate. And then there's the balancing environmental and social good. I mean, we have modern slavery uh, certainly coming to our shores in Australia. So, again, you know, is it, is it about local? Is it about um, environment? Is it about health and safety? Is it about making sure that people here are fine that made it? Um, or is it actually knowing that the whole supply chain and and people who've made it um, even in developing countries have have not been harmed or you know in the making of something just so you can have a you know a slight discount in a in a product or a cheaper t-shirt? So I think we really need to ask our own selves around our values as well and, and start to question the supply chain to make that decision because. Um, you know, and, and actually look at the specific product, maybe dig deeper than just the actual company that's selling it. Mm. Because, I mean, there's some real, I mean, the, the huge challenges there in our global economy, isn't there? Because regulations across borders vary so much. They do. And it's something that our eco labels are really trying to work with. So there's um, an organisation called the Global Eco Labeling Network, um, of which we're a member and I'm on the board. And, you know, there's many countries with the national eco-label, a lot of them government-owned um, and run, and where we all have our own standards. And they're all of the same type and they're very similar. But, of course, there's those subtle differences around thresholds or, you know, acceptability of a VOC or a type of dye in a material. And so how do we work with that and negotiate that? Because this is a huge trade issue and, you know, we do have – global supply chains now it's in, you know it it touches often you know 15 20 countries before before you're holding it in your hand so to actually even access that information we're looking at you know how do we how do we have more transparent um, and and true knowledge through things like blockchain how do we share that data and actually how do we sort of fight the fight together like there might need to even be a bit of compromise between acceptance and working together within all of our standards so that we can kind of move towards a more um, transferable, equal, global, eco-label level. And I think, you know, because we are a global consumer these days, you know, we are moving towards that. And there's a lot of um, United Nations environment are working with us to, you know, help that harmonisation of schemes, as it's known. Um, but it's not easy and, it's you know, of course we all have our own, um, national concerns and also differences. You know, water is it, you know, even us working with the New Zealand eco label, you know, for New Zealand, water is not an issue. So it doesn't usually come up in their standards, whereas for Australia, in a large part of our manufacturing, and as we very well know at the moment, you know, water is a huge issue. So they are part of our standards where it's impactful. So you know, it, it is really complex and we're trying to make it simple, but we do absolutely need to work together um, in, in, in on a global level uh, to coordinate and systemise this. Because mm. these environmental issues are actually, while we are starting to think a little bit more nationalistically recently, um, then the problems don't just stop at borders, do they? I mean, pollutants don't go, oh, this was created in this country, let's just stop right here. It doesn't quite work like that. No, it certainly doesn't. And I think, you know, we also have that problem where some people, you know, we're looking at it with modern slavery as well. Or some, mm. You know, some people are generalising and think, oh, well, you know, a lot of people will say to me, well, anything out of China is crap. Like, quote, end quote, will be really blunt around it. And I say, mm. well, actually, that's not true. That's really actually not true. And, you know, we have manufacturers and licensees here who uh, manufacture in China as well. Um, they might, so they'll do it here and in China and they'll do it to their level here. They're, you know, China is doing, their government is mandating eco-label and that's, that's a game changer. As soon as your own government goes, 
do you know what? We need to use our own eco label. Why? Because we know that buying best practice and reducing environmental and and health and harm to our people is going to number one be the right thing, but also number two, you know, economically save us money on the long, on the mid to long term. So some of it's about long term thinking and carbon and climate change commitments, which very much fit in you know product manufacturing as well. There's some great leadership in some of these countries that you know where I think we sometimes assume in Australia that you know they're not doing such a good job, and it's just not the case. Mm-hmm. Now, I heard you say that at that conference, and I was really encouraged by that, that you've seen some very positive things come out of China, which, which stereotypically, as you say, gets a bad rap. Yeah, that's right. And it doesn't mean that everything that comes out of there is, is of that quality. But mm-hmm. there is certainly a very strong government mandate, and we've got you know countries like, um, so we represent um, and work with the Department of Foreign Affairs to represent at APEC in a green supply chain network. And that's about those, you know, large uh, and countries and economies within APEC working together to try and harmonise that, that, that very thing, that sort of green and healthy supply chain. Mm. And so China and Korea are very much part of that. And, and their governments are fully committed to um, ensuring that happens. And where other problems happen is things like, you know, there is, you know, corruption or areas where there's less control sometimes can be more of an issue. Um, but they are also onto that and aware of that and um, committed to that. But I think also, you know, committing to your own eco label or procurement of best practice, whether it's an eco label or a full knowing the full data and impacts of a product like a life cycle analysis, means you know, in some level, you know, if our government is a conscious consumer, <laughs> it really is a game changer. And and how do we then? demonstrate that leadership is like a role model for you know the general consumer as well to then go right okay well it makes it more accessible more affordable more products come onto the market um it's easier to identify and then everyone has and everyone should have the right to be able to choose something that's you know healthy and good for themselves and their family and and in your dealings with governments uh, both federal and state in australia are they coming on board? I think I think there's some you know some challenges and there's also some some optimistic movement. You know, our, our government has committed um, to the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, which is great, and we are reporting on that. I think there's a lot of um, delegation to civil society like ourselves to do this for them, and I would like a more coordinated cooperative way to work with them because I think it, it actually needs to have some level of partnership rather than, than delegation. Um, so I think, you know, there's there's opportunity for improvement. Um, now, that's probably at a federal level. Um, circular economy, the New South Wales is just um, releasing a policy on that and really taking that seriously. So that's great to see too. The so state level is a different matter. You know, it's probably in Australia still quite dominated at the moment Maybe we're just a bit behind, but we're still on the about energy and energy efficiency and mm. and some of those broader conversations. Whereas I think we also um, need to dig a little deeper into materiality um, as well. Uh, but we are doing well on you know bringing in the modern slavery reporting. That's fantastic. Um, you know, indigenous procurement I think is really important. The challenge is we need to do it all. And we need to do it all in all and I know that mm. sounds that's the difficult thing. And that that's that's the challenge. We need to hold all of it and we need to find the best way to transition this. And it needs to be at all local government levels, all state levels and a federal level. And then we need to cooperate and work with all the international and intergovernment, you know, like you know, the UN and APEC and um, and, and other groups to actually coordinate because it's not just a national problem and it's not just a national supply chain and we will need to coordinate and work together and maybe lower our, you know, sort of barriers on, you know, certainly we can't be protectionist around trade or, you know, we have to find ways to do this well because, you know, environmental and health situations, whether it's air pollution or water toxicity, uh, you know, looking at our ocean, 
mm. water waves. It, you know, one country affects the other. You know, as you say, it's not a closed border. We're not all safe from, from just what we do within our own country. So ultimately we are going to have to come up with a global situation and, and, and all take responsibility. So that's where I'd like to see more action. Yeah. You've mentioned it a couple of times in passing modern slavery. Can you, and, and I just wonder if you could share with our listener, how big a problem is this? So how does it manifest itself? Look, it's a, a far bigger problem than we think. And I think it's something, you know, we, we have that sort of uh, image of, um, you know, slaves or people tied up um, and it always being offshore. But it's actually, you know, it's not the case. It does happen here in Australia, number one. Um, sometimes it's just bonded labour. Uh, sometimes it's through our supply chains. Um, but there are people in Australia, we've seen it with some of the issues, you know, 7 or 11 would just be one example, but how businesses with use of contractors can suddenly discover that people either aren't being treated properly or they're being forced to stay in some way. Um, and, and, and then if you look at offshore and our supply chains, it's just big, it's a huge economy. Like there are people out in the world that don't want us to start looking at you know, where there's, you know, unfair treatment of people, um, you know, to make our stuff because, you know, someone's profiting from it. Mm. Um, And the more we look at it and dig on it and take responsibility for it, then the more we're going to find it. So the more that we can all commit as consumers and businesses to do the right thing, it means it'll just have to start stopping. Um, But we also need to take you know, great care. So the, the New South Wales legislation has passed. We're still waiting for the federal level, but we're expecting it to come shortly. Um, but, you know, we all also need to take care. This isn't about pressing alarm bells. We have to work again with people so that they're not left in a worse situation. And and we have had this happen, you know, with, with GECA and manufacturers going through their audit. We have had the occasion where going to that on-site audit to check the manufacturing of their product and interviewing the employees. They've met with people who had their passports locked up and weren't allowed to leave. And for situations like that, you know, if, if we were to suddenly turn around and go, oh, you know, you're doing, you're doing this, um, you've got, you know, employees locked up, um, they could be in a worse situation. So we actually need to encourage our suppliers, wherever they are in the world, to, you know, start... Start working with um, uh, with a clear expectation to say, you know what, this isn't going to. This is what we want moving forward. Um, not even at an ac- accusational level, but we're, we're starting to look for our supply chain. This is what's going to be acceptable, and so we're going to expect you to be able to um, demonstrate for us to meet with your employees. Um, that everyone is being fairly and safely treated, um, and and from there, you know, making sure that those communities have ongoing work, but in a you know in a fair way, um, rather than you know if we suddenly stop buying those products, then those communities will also you know greatly suffer. Which takes us back to the community conversation that we started with. You know, mm-hmm. is our community just in the street where we live? Or is a community, indeed a global community, that we also have a responsible, you know, we're responsible for. So, you know, I think it's the latter. And I think how do we hold all of that and, and care in a very considerate way um, through transition to be able to make sure that, that everyone is treated fairly in this process just because we're, we're wanting to buy more stuff? You know, let's make sure we do it well. I often think that that's part of what is the tension for us at the moment globally is that at the end of the day, we're a kind of still a hunter-gatherer with our tribe of 150 is about all we can cope with. And yet we're being asked to think globally about, and, and it's undeniably we're globally connected and it's almost too much. So we have to think nationally. Let's get nationalistic about it. It's kind of this this tension that goes on between acting locally and being in the community and tribe and yet having to think globally, and we have to. Yeah, and I think that, that you know, think global, act local, local approach is, you know, a good motto for that. I think it is something we challenge with, and I I think 150 is something we struggle with now too, actually. I, you know, I think as um, fear, fear comes and unknown and, pace of life and expectation and some of that goes back to marketing and consumerism and 
size of house and, you know, what we should all be providing, um, you know, as well as being, you know, you know, we are a global community anyway because a lot of people move around and don't live, you know, where their parents or grandparents are anymore. So, but but I think as all of those pressures come, somehow, you know, that, that sense of need to protect self as the hunter-gatherer is becoming stronger. Mm. And I think, I think that's what I'm seeing and maybe is the, more the concern for me um, is, you know, <clears throat> we're not, you know, we have to look after them more than ourselves as well as hold the fact that it's challenging, that, you know, there's you know, huge expectations, there's economic challenges, there's environmental challenges, there's work challenges, there's family pressures, there's you name it. We all know that life's getting faster and more stressful or so that it feels. But how do we also, you know, um, well, I'll tell you actually that I'm also on the board of the Living Future Institute of Australia and they just had a beautiful symposium and they had a lovely speaker and kick off the event. Um, and she said, you know, to sum it up was, you know, keep calm and be generous. That's kind of all we can do. And I think, I think there's something really in that just, you know, amongst all of this, how do we be calm and continue at every challenge to continue to, to be generous and care for other as well as ourselves? Um, we're going to have to find a way to do that because otherwise it's dog eat dog <laughs> and I don't want to live there. Mm. What was the organisation, Living, L- Living Future? Institute of Australia. Wow, fantastic. Look, I know there's another um, institute you mentioned, and I'm not sure whether you're on the board of it or connected with it, but that was the International Wellbeing Institute, Wellbuilding Institute, Wellbuilding Institute. Is Gecka just collaborate with that or are you connected with that as well? Tell us a bit about that, In what that is. Yeah, look, it's a, it's a wonderful building scheme essentially and, and they really are driving – health and wellness, um, mainly in commercial buildings, but with looking for out for you know, staff and employees and people who work in those buildings for so many hours of their life. Um, I'm not on the board, I, but I am very connected to it. In fact, we've got one of our employees over there in meetings in New York at the moment, and, um, but they have a wonderful scheme. Our eco-label goes into that scheme. So if you've, you know, it looks at things like the importance of air quality or furniture, and so for instance, our furniture um, with the Gecka Eco label will get points um, if they use that in that that well scheme. And why is because it's purely around the health of the people in it. They know that the the sum of those products, the sum of the stuff that gets shoved in these buildings, can make us sick. Um, mm. You know, it's, it's volatile organic compounds. There's carcinogenic materials. There's formaldehyde. And it becomes like a toxic soup that we sit in and think, oh, this is, you know, lovely furnishings. But do we really understand what it might be doing? And then we keep going, coming in with cleaners and putting in new toxic mm. <laughs> chemicals mm. in mm. to make it clean and good for us. You know, again, are we really looking at what this stuff's doing to us? And that's what's fantastic about the World Scheme is that it's going, you know what, the health of people in these buildings matter and, and we, you know, um, Large organisations, like there's a beautiful Mervac building here in Sydney um, that is a, a gold well rated. And, and it's Mervac saying, we care about our people. We want to make sure that the building and the space we create where you work for us and with us is looking after you as well. And there's fantastic stats. I mean, it's well known, you know, there's been some information about 30% more productivity um, of people in these buildings. But it's it's also around, you know, health and well-being, and you know, for me, it's also about the right thing to yeah. do. It's not just making them more productive, obviously, and you know. And then we go to looking at, you know, New South Wales um, are doing a lot of building for their for their schools and in the education department, and I'm sure, you know, and many other states around Australia. So, imagine if we had well building, um, you know, within our education department for our schools and our students. And then you could take it into a living building, which is the Living Future Institute of Australia and has, has, has a living building challenge, which is all about you know, biophilia and justice as well as health and energy and water and it all being about rejuvenation and renewal and it actually being a very aspirational but achievable building where we actually you know, do thrive 
um, we are healthy, but even better, we're, we're you know, we're really um, nurtured in, in who we are and, and how we can connect together and, um, yeah, and nature. Mm. Now, another organisation, Kate, you're an absolute, um, you know, God, when I, when I heard your CV and all the things you were connected to, but here's another organisation that I do know about and, and, I, and, and that's the One Million Women. You're an ambassador for that. Tell us, tell out, tell out, share with our listener what One Million Women is all about. Uh, it's such a lovely initiative and it's such a privilege and, um, you know, Natalie and Tara have this, created such a beautiful organization which really just came about you know with women creating change like women caring about this and I have to say you know I've been in sustainability a long time now and there's a lot of women in it and mm. and where it gets more technical there's a lot of men and 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 you know sometimes we struggle to even employ to find men who are willing to be in this space and I'm I really find that bizarre, actually. Um, you know, is it the sort of the, you know, like you were saying, the hunt together and it's more the, the female role to sort of, you know, look out for community? I don't know, but mm. I, I think it takes all of us and I'm very passionate about that. So this this is about bringing together women, but not just women. You know, there's many yep. men who are, contribute to this. But it is about us coming together as a force, Um and knowing that through that as creating a movement, we really can create a significant difference. And it has created a, a global movement and a commitment to things like climate change and, and to creating a better future. And um, such a wonderful, it's one of those, it's one of those groups where wherever you're amongst, um, you know, at a gathering, um, you just feel it. It's, mm. it's the heart of it. But it's also about the doing of it and, and coming together as, as a force. Um, so it's such, it is such a wonderful uh, group to be a part of and um, it really is getting global traction. And, um, of course, it's going to take more than women, but, you know, we're a pretty powerful force to be reckoned with too. So, um, yes, it's an honour to be a part of it. Mm, mm, yes, well, I, I, I admire it tremendously and, gee, I think the sooner we let women take over and care for the planet and just get men to, you know, we've got a lot to learn. I do think it's gone back to those very primitive instincts that translate into some very aggressive behaviour and, and not very caring. And uh, anyway, we could talk at length about that one. Um, listen, if you had to leave our listener with a few tips for becoming more conscious consumers... Um, what would, how would we get people start? I think a lot of my listeners are, are tuned into this message, but if they weren't, if they were just joining us and, and they wanted to get going on it, what would be a couple of tips you'd, you'd give to get them going? I think um, to find out what things to care about first, you know, the low-hanging fruit, good to go to our website, www.gecka.eco, because we choose standards that matter. We don't choose standards that are easy. So, you know, if you go on and look at our standards, all of our standards are you can download and have a look at. Um, but, you know, it's things like uh, furniture, paint, flooring, you know, these the mattresses. Um, you know, they're just some examples. But they are the things that you'd, you'd start to think about or your insulation or your panelling board. If you're renovating or cleaning products and you're cleaning your house, like what, just look at them and say, okay, well, if I'm building a new house, I can keep this in mind. What materials am I going to be around for, you know, 12, 18 hours a day? If I'm renovating, what can I do? If I'm not, what can I do right now in terms of my surrounds and my environment and, and, and start to learn about what things might matter or be most impactful right now and what you can do about it in terms of, you know, consuming better. I think the second thing is start asking the question, like asking your shop, go to them and say, you know, do you have an eco-label product? Uh, it says low VOC. Um, how much VOC is in that? How do you know that? Do you work with a third party? Um, start to educate and know where the hotspots, we call it hotspots, but where the concern, areas of concern are and start speaking to your manufacturer or your salesperson. You know, most likely they're not going to know and that's another challenge. But you asking them does have an impact. They start to come back and, and speak to the manufacturer and say, actually, we need to start um, having this information. I have a, a board director on our Gecko board who's lovely. She had a group of women 
that once a month they'd all go out into the shops and all ask for things like a six-star fridge. They'd all ask for the same thing on the same day. <laughs> and it was priceless because <laughs> it would get recorded, right? And yeah. so the fact that they'd all go out and, you know, they didn't buy it, but they – but the message got there because suddenly there was this influx of, oh, guess what? You know, it's almost playing the marketing game back to them yep. and saying, you know, <laughs> us as consumers, we're going to coordinate and tell you what we want. And if you think we want it, then you'll start doing it and then we actually can get it. Um, so it's taking back the power and mm. also knowing, you know, we, we talk about purchasing power. So know that, you know, like when I heard about people wanting to buy my eyeballs, I was like, my eyeball time, I was like, wow, that's, you know, I really have started to think about my purchasing power and how my purchasing power can align to my values. So it's, you know, values are important to me, but, but me and my spend, um, and if I can do it consciously, really does make a difference, even at an individual level, and even if it's about just sending a message. Um, so I really, you know, encourage people to, you know, take that right and enjoy that privilege and, and use it consciously and know that you are indeed making a difference. Mm. Mm. No, no, they're great things and, uh, and, and, and I think a, a great starting point for people. Listen, let's just finally, I want to ask you one more question and taking a step back from your role as a, a CEO and involved in all of these different organisations, because we're all on a health journey in our own lives, what do you think the biggest challenge is for people on their health journey through life in our modern world? Oh, wow. Wow. Um... I think it is calm and present and, and, and establishing that. And, you know, it's a, it's a personal challenge for me as well. I have that challenge between busy life and trying to be out there creating change and things I'm passionate about, which feels like I'm running around the world and being really busy. Um, but how do I also have that calm and presence and, you know, insight. Um, I used to, many moons ago, I used to teach meditation and and be a meditation teacher. Um, and now I struggle to get my five or ten minutes in a day and I'm very conscious of that. And so I think that's the biggest challenge. How do we still be present amongst the busyness? How do we still care and connect amongst it and not let it control us either? Um, I think that's our challenge and our opportunity because, you know, the the power of being present actually is, is will will be required for us to achieve and overcome all of these other broader challenges we've talked about today. So, you know, and also caring for ourselves. I in working in sustainability, we often talk about the aeroplane masks. You know, when the aeroplane has dropped an altitude and the mask come down, you have to put your own on before your child. Hmm. And it's, it seems illogical for a parent or a carer. It's, you know, it feels contradictory. The first instinct would be to put on your own child, but you have to put on your own because if you pass out, you're not going to be able to help your child anyway or even to be able to get off the plane. So... Uh, and there's a plane going overhead as I say that. So, you know, it's, I think we do need to balance the being and the doing um, and, and bring in order for us to take care of our own health and well-being, to be conscious and then to be able to take that consciousness out into the world to help others and support others in their um, consciousness and, and, you know, and for our community. Well, Kate, um, thank you for being present with me today and I really appreciate you sharing your time. Thanks very much, Ron. I've really appreciated, um, you know, the questions and I'm, I'm glad to have shared some stories and, you know, there's lots, lots to be done in this space, lots of opportunities for people um, in their purchasing and consumption, and I, you know, I really think we can fight the good wash, the good fight against greenwash. You know, we we can really do that together, and and it's coming actually. So, um, yeah, I think good things are ahead. Thanks, Kate.
Thanks very much, Ron. The whole issue of environmental toxins is a huge one. We are literally exposed to thousands of chemicals each and every day. They're in our air, in our water, food, personal care and household cleaning products, clothes and furniture, and again, much more. Go back and listen to my interviews with Professor Mark Cohen on the 10 Toxic Truths and the two episodes I did with Nicole Bilgema, an absolute legend, Australia's leading building biologist. And of course, the one with Alex Stewart, Australia's leading champion of low-tox living. Look, we assume these chemicals that we're exposed to in millions of products have all been tested and are safe. But the reality is that the vast majority have actually not been tested. And if they have been, it's in isolation, one at a time, not in the way we are exposed to them. And that is in multiple combinations for years on end. The good news is that by making informed decisions, and the Gecko Eco label is one way to help, then you can reduce you and your family's toxic load by 80 to 90%. The other thing that Kate mentioned was ask questions. Now, I recently reflected on this in my local shops. About 15, it may have been more years ago, I walked into my local butcher shop for some beef and I asked whether the beef had been grass-fed or grain-fed. Well, the butchers turned and looked at me as though I was crazy. What was I asking such a silly question for? They politely ignored me. It's fine. I don't usually shop there, but... In the last few months, I noticed each week they have their specials painted up on the window and they are now proudly spruiking their grass-fed beef. So questions make a difference. Look, we vote once every few years and we could debate how powerful that is, but we vote every day with how we spend our money. Are we just good consumers or are we conscious consumers and in the process, good citizens? not just for our local community, but for the world. Mark Cohen said, we are all connected, so we are all affected, and we could go on to say, by every decision we all make. Remember, both Kate and I said we were optimists, and we mostly are. In planning nowadays, also, we hear about the triple bottom line. That usually means social, environmental, and financial factors need to be considered in good planning. But I would argue that there is actually a quadruple bottom line, adding one other very important factor. In fact, you could argue this really is just the bottom line, and that factor is health. Not just our individual health, but the health of the planet. The two are inseparable. We will have links to the Gekka's site and also to the One Million Women, which I'm really keen to explore in another episode. So until next time, this is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. Be well. This podcast provides general information and discussion about medicine, health and related subjects. The content is not intended and should not be construed as medical advice or as a substitute for care by a qualified medical practitioner. If you or any other person has a medical concern, he or she should consult with an appropriately qualified medical.